You ready to have a little chat? I'm ready, buddy. All right. What's it been, like 25 years now? This is so surreal. Yeah, that's crazy. Factory Talk 103, Nick Carter here, hanging out with uh, the man, Ken Casey of Dropkick Murphys. This machine still kills fascists. Ugh. Tell you, man. This machine kills fascists. 1943, Woody Guthrie slaps that on his guitar, and the world was forever changed. Yeah, inspired a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, because you and I have talked about, in the past, about you and the band discovering your parents' Chieftains or Kingston Trio records. It's part of the genesis of the band. For me, it was like my parents' Odetta records or Aretha or Tom Rush. But I went to a Quaker school, so it was all Woody Guthrie all the oh, time, wow. right? Why did he click with you? I mean, he is the original punk. Yeah, I re well, I mean, I first obviously remember, I always remember, and I, it must have been a teacher or something at uh, St. Mary of the Hill School being played, this land is your land, and um, being explained to me that it was like the people's national anthem. And even at a, like, a really young age, I, I liked how that it just kind of registered with me. But then as a teen, finding out your own, um, you know, your own musical influences and stuff, it was definitely... Um, you know, seeing that guys like Joe Strummer and, yeah. and Bruce Springsteen were into uh, were so inspired by him, and then I did the deeper dive into what he stood for and everything, and uh, that's when I realized he was the man. Yeah, I always thought of the Dropkicks as a uh, more of a populist band, whereas Woody's just unapologetically political, right. like like just wore it all in his sleeves, right? And it's funny. I mean, why were you drawn to that? Because or were you drawn to that too? Because a lot of bands will absolutely shy away from that. Um, you know, I, I just feel like that's what we did from the start of the band. We right. sung about stuff that was, poli you know, political in our eyes, a lot of st more like labor and union related stuff, which was something that Woody was, you know, hugely involved in. And then, you know, um, you know, you know, when you talk about stuff on this record and, you know, his fight against fascism and stuff it's like well who doesn't want to fight against fascism so um yeah you know it's in and, and you know in the whole like punk rock scene when you're really down in it has always had that slight little underbelly of right. that, that really especially in boston would never show their face you know what i mean but but in other parts of the country it was it was real we used to have problems that shows um you know, with them coming after us and stuff. So, like, we've, we've always been kind of on the front lines of that stuff, you know, so. Well, I remember everything back in the day. Like, if you saw somebody with a shaved head, you had to, like, check to see what color laces they had and all yeah, that yeah. shit. And it's so funny you say that. Who doesn't want to fight fascism? But, you know. Well, it's a very much of a triggering word these days now. Uh, yeah. Because, um, you know, you know, people throw throw the word around, like, they change the meaning and say, right. no, you're a fascist. No, you're a right. fascist. Uh, but it's like I, Nazi. I mean, people have been people have been yeah. like sort of just really sort of loosely throwing a word, throwing around the word fascism for a long time. Yeah. But now it's actually there's you know concrete concrete uh, examples of it. Like in Sweden, yeah. Sweden. Yeah. What the? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. So I I just feel like you know we're just kind of carrying on in Woody's legacy, and we were searching for a title. We were like, well, man, nothing. Nothing says it more than, you know, you know, especially on the punk side of things, how that really registered with people so much and, I, and you know, how it caught my attention. And so, yeah, we figured, especially in the time and, you know, place that we're in now politically, it just seemed like the right, it just seemed like the right thing to do. Like I call, when I thought of the idea, I called, you know, Nora, his, uh, Woody's daughter, and I said, what do you think of this? She was like, whoa. Okay, well, that's not beating around the bush, you know? And I was like, no, it isn't. <laughs> yeah, the album is This Machine Still Kills Fascists. And first of all, respect. I want to say thank you. I forgot to when we sat down because I was just so excited to see you after so, so many years. I always appreciate when an artist comes through on release day because that's a big thing. So I, I, I really appreciate you oh, being here. Oh, it's great. That. Thanks for having me on. I mean, it's nice to, you know, real, you know nowadays, I mean, I, I guess there was always that delay and wait but nowadays like with vinyl like vinyl dictates as a matter of fact the vinyl is not even out today it's not out till like november 11th right you have to hand everything in so long right and then you wait so long for it to come out that it's a big day when it finally gets there you yeah. know what i mean so well you brought up nora um you have uh you've had the blessing of the guthrie estate for some time i'm shipping up to boston prove that i want to get back to that because not everyone knows that there's a woody connection to that song 
But when they initially reached out to you, was it her? Because, um, I, I mean, what, she felt like you you guys are carrying on Woody's spirit and mission? I mean, Jesus Christ, man, no pressure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think that she kind of always says, like, you know, there's, there's, you know, Woody has some kumbaya kind of stuff that folk artists can do, and then he has a lot of stuff that she thinks of us as the the, the artists that represent that that rebellious fight fighter spirit that her father definitely also had. Um, so when she first contacted us, um, you know, yeah, I, I, I thought it was like a joke or something, you know, because in, in the, I'll tell you when we first went, now everything's on computer, all his lyrics, you know, right. unpublished lyrics. But when I first went 20 years ago, you actually held the pieces of paper. It was a special, um, you know, temperature controlled room, humidity, all that, whatever. And, and I had to wear special white gloves and I got to hold the actual pieces of paper he wrote them on. And a lot of these are, you know, 80, 90 years old. And, right. Um, I, it was better than going to any museum or anything like that. It was, it was wild. And he dates all the pages, which really was amazing because when he's writing something, you know, you know, considering a lot of these songs that we've been using a, anywhere from mid thirties to mid fifties, I mean, wow. that date tells you a lot about because a lot happened in the, that time frame, you know. Yeah. So, so you get into his archives and you find his unfinished lyrics or incorporate his lyrics into your own, and you write songs that seem to honor Woody's sound and vision, but still sound like the drop kicks. That's that's an interesting needle to thread, kid. Yeah, we, yeah. I mean, we, we, you know, we we didn't have to put too much pressure on ourselves to, you know, we, this record we did acoustic and went to Tulsa to give the nod, but we definitely still wanted, and it definitely has an Americana kind of flavor. But we we re, really knew that obviously it has to sound like Dropkick Murphys because yeah. you know. You know, we have a fan base that's going to listen to it and going to want, you know, you can you, you can deviate, you can stretch your limits, but ultimately people want to hear Dropkick Murphys too. But but then again, we've always had this kind of sign to, side to us. I mean, even if you think about the song Rose Tattoo, that is right. probably our, that is our second biggest song, and it's very much in this vein, you know what I mean? And um, and we've had other songs that are in the same kind of Americana fa- vein, and um, obviously lyrically talk top lyrical topics have been you know similar throughout i guess the the main difference is just full-on stripped down acoustic and it wasn't just acoustic like let's put that acoustic through an amp we were just up to microphones playing this so there was no you know which was the real challenge to make it sound powerful because you know you couldn't use over pedals and overdrive matter of fact one part in the song cadillac cadillac to create the overdriven guitar sound you know we put uh, you know, a regular piece of paper through the through the guitar strings, and it creates a no, buzzing for sound. Real? Yeah, yeah. And so it's it's purely an overdub kind of thing, you right. know, because it also sounds like crap. But when you beat on the strings, it has that creates that sound. Yeah, so there's I, a lot of cool experiments like that, you know. I could, you know, Cadillac, Cadillac. I couldn't believe how intense and loud it was because I mean. It's funny when I heard, you know, they're doing an acoustic album. And to your point, yeah, you've you've dabbled in acoustic stuff in the past. I kind of sort of shirked for a second, but not only does it sound like drop kicks, it's intense, but a different kind of intensity too. Like if you weren't doing a sit down tour, you know, as you're going to do, like a sit down, uh, you know, uh, the, the people will be sitting. Well, I was well no, say, no, the people will be in seats. They better not be sitting. Well, okay, well, and we say, certainly won't be. I was going to say, if, you know, if, if if it weren't a seated tour, there would be a pit. Hey, there still yeah. might be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, there was when we booked this tour. A few of the places were like, um, we're concerned about the state of our seats when it leaves. Yeah, so. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I expect it to be. Um, you know, the reason we did a seated tour is we really wanted to. Um, you know, hammer home that this was different and make the whole experience different, you know, that which gets back to why we didn't say, well, we're going to do it mostly acoustic, but then you, you know, because we just wanted it to really draw that line in the sand that we were doing something different, you know? Well, I think when people hear acoustic, they think, you know, mellow and sleepy, but, you know. Or, you know, from the Celtic side, you know, two old guys on a bar stool. Right, right. I mean, that are just, (laughs) you know, mellow and... You know, uh, maybe not mellow, but still just thin and stripped down, you know. Some of these songs are unbelievable. All You Phonies is probably my favorite. The last one literally brought me to tears. I mean, you know, I've known you for years. I mean, I would, I'm not going to bullshit you, but 
Dig a Hole is amazing. I mean, how surreal was it hearing your voice duetting with Woody Guthrie for the first time? No, that was that was creepy but awesome. Like it was just yeah. And then you know the the full story there. The last thing we did on this record was background vocals on that song, and Woody's grandson Cole was doing background wow. vocals, and he was right beside me. So out of the corner of my eye, I'm hearing his grandfather's voice and I'm looking and he's singing with us and I was just like, oh, this is full, all gone completely full circle. Totally you know? full circle, yeah. yeah. Talking to Ken Casey of the uh, Dropkick Murphys, the album is This Machine Still Kills Fascists. Many years ago, I did a thing with Lenny Kravitz at the uh, Fort Apache Recording Studio and he had just bought the board that the Beatles did Sgt. Pepper on. And, you know, knowing his Len- uh, like uh, John Lennon relationship, oh. Um, cause when he was signed, the guy in the room said, looked at him, like wrote a note and said, Prince meets John Lennon. So he goes out and he buys the Beatle board. And so live in front of like 500 people, I said to him, I was like, so, you know, knowing your affinity for John, when you work on that board, you know, do you get John's essence? And he just looks at me in dead pen. He goes, brother, it's just a piece of equipment. Wow. Which was so, <laughs> like, you clown me so hard. You guys, on the other hand, actually went to Oklahoma, um, and yeah, we're way more spiritual. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we finished speaking of the Beatle connection. We went to Oklahoma, and George Harrison's wife came in and visited us in the studio. Really? How did that? Yeah, happen? we did it at the church studio. Leon Russell's uh, built that studio, and there's always like semi-famous people rolling through there. It's like a museum as well in there. And um, so we went to Oklahoma to get in the vibe, and um, and. And Tulsa was great because Woody's Archives and Museum is down the street, so a lot of mornings we'd go by there with a cup of coffee and just be floating around before they opened in the museum. But the real inspiration came when we went to Woody's hometown of Okima, um, Oklahoma, and, man, you could just feel that really small town, somewhat kind of depression. A lot of the storefronts are closed, you know, just that, like, middle America... um, small kind of you know town that you know maybe you know maybe that I, I don't know what it was like back in woody's day well obviously from reading and stuff about him i do to a degree but seeing all, a lot of the cl- storefronts closed and stuff it was just you, you really got the essence of what inspired him and um i, I felt something like i had I, I said to nora i feel like i've been here before so um, we have a little joke that maybe i'm Maybe I am Woody reincarnated. <laughs> um, also, it's a crazy small world. And the last one, which has Evan Felka from the Turnpike Troopers yeah. on it, when we asked him to do it, we had no idea, but he was born in Okima and just moved back there. Wow. So, like, it's a small town, man. So the odds of that are, like, almost crazy, you know? Is, I mean, it's the town at this point, because I've never been. I, I want to get to Tulsa, and I want to get there, too. Is it kind of like a living monument to, to Woody? Ah uh, well, we we were shooting some videos there, so we were walking around playing, and a couple people would pull them and said, "You're doing Guthrie stuff, you know? Like they must <laughs> just every day be random musicians walking around playing." But one old timer in a truck said, "You know, come with me," and he brought us in this old I don't know what it was. It was some some storefront that was all closed up, and in the back they had like a replica, like almost like a dollhouse size replica of the house he was born in and yeah. all this other, wow. like, and you know, and it looked like no one was, it wasn't like it was open to the public to see it. I, I don't know what was going on, but we got to go in and kind of see some other really cool Guthrie, um, you know, archive stuff that, that wasn't even being viewed. So I love that you're doing this because if nothing else, yeah, I mean, you've got, guys my age but you still have kids coming to the shows you know and 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 a lot of people a lot of americans the depth of their understanding of what he what he is this land is your land house of the rising sun but i mean this guy it, i mean if you dig in it's unbelievable yeah and what's really cool is they be able to introduce it to people internationally not that no you know right. not that there aren't people that know him but a lot of like the press that i was doing in other countries was saying wow you know like we really don't know that much about him, so it's a good introduction for him. And I think that's the whole point of, obviously, it's the whole point of, of the Guthrie family allowing people to do this because you're bringing his music to new generations, you know, and, and especially music that otherwise would be sitting in a box somewhere, right. you know. Right. 
Well, and and the, the by the way, just to let you know, like in the archives when you go in, some are done on a typewriter, perfect. <laughs> Others look like he wrote it in the dock on his knee. You know what I mean? Like really have to like, what is he saying here? And then and they weren't always finished songs. They have everything in there from these just like stream of consciousness type of things to stuff that you could tell he clearly didn't finish. I mean, shipping up to Boston, which obviously a lot of people don't know was his lyrics. That's the first thing we, I'm just going through all these deep lyrics and then I stumble on shipping up to Boston. I lost my leg and I was like, what was he smoking this day? <laughs> but the thing about that song is because it almost seemed like it wasn't finished and didn't have a lot of words, it kind of made that song because the inst- because we had we didn't have a lot to work with, there's a lot of space in the song. But the space really cr- is the secret to that song's success because you have the words and then that instrumental part goes and goes and it really builds for the chorus. If I was writing the words to that song, and by the way, we had written that song already, so we were just waiting for me to write words to it, and then I found Woody's words. So if I wrote the words over the huge, long instrumental part before the chorus, I know I would have wrote a pre-chorus. Right. And it just would have got filled up, you know what I mean? And it, and it wouldn't have had the magic. You know? Well, I wanted to ask you about that because, okay, so first of all, how much... So you, you, you're you finding his his unfinished works. Now, are we talking, you know... Maybe like a lyric or like literally like like a little scrap of paper with just like a song title. Was it like all kinds of stuff? Like all that? kinds of stuff, yeah. And so you're just literally yeah. putting everything together like a quilt. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And we had to, you know, we got we got to use add a line here and there and use some liberties, move things around. But you know, as best as possible, we tried to. We wanted to make sure we never changed something to the point where he might have been, you know, from the other side going, "No, right. no, no, that's not right. what I meant," right, you right, know. Right, right. But I think I th- I think we got it. I think we got it. I think we got his point across. You know. Well, that's funny. I mean, so drop kicks have been part of some of the biggest cultural moments of the past decade or so, and I'm shipping up to Boston, of course, departed, and you know, I, I as I say, I'm sure a lot of people don't know that there was a Woody connection to that. How did that come about? That it actually got in the movie? Because I remember when I remember when you re-recorded it on the Warriors Code. So how did it end up in the movie, and what was the immediate effect afterwards? So while they were here filming, I had a ton of friends that had small little, you know, local pots in it. And they were all like, yeah, talking to Marty, he's going to get your music in. And I'm like, oh, really? You're talking to Marty, huh? Marty, uh, Marty, my boy's in a band. You should check him out. (laughs) Basically. So everybody took credit. So right before the movie wrapped, um, you know, because people don't realize like that, a lot of that stuff with the music isn't happening until the end. And we got a call and said, you know, we want to use the song once. Or we said, okay. They said, then we got to call back. We want to use the song twice. Oh, we want to use the song in the trailer. And we kept saying, wow, this is getting better and better. And I was thanking a bunch of my friends who were all taking credit for the longest <laughs> time. And then I read it like a Rolling Stone article. And Robbie uh, uh, Scorsese says, I got to thank, you know. And actually, he said it when when... When Scorsese did his Oscar speech, he came off the stage and then they immediately go into like a press room. This was on TV. And he, the first thing he says in the post-stage uh, press interview was, I want to thank that band from Boston, Dropkick Murphys. I was shocked. And he says, and Robbie Robinson from the band who brought me the song. Wow. And I read that in a Rolling Stone interview too. So I'm saying, oh, son of a bitch. All those guys <laughs> taking credit had zero to do with it, you know? So, uh, so yeah, Robbie Robertson. Who knew? He's the one that does all the scores, bring, you know, the sto- all the great Stone stuff. You know, I mean, Scorsese movies have awesome, awesome. It's not so much the song. I mean, with, our, with us, it was just the way it was placed in the movie. And it was just so, it was also, by the way, I'm, I'm the pessimist in the band. So I always go, well, it was all, you know, like I don't want to get overexcited or whatever. When it I went to the premiere, so aw- I mean, it's it not so the departed loud. without. It. Yeah, it's not the departed without the song, yeah. and it, it plays so many times. Yeah, it has to be loud because um, I remember we were in the Sopranos once, and I'm sitting home, that. I'm sitting home waiting and watching, and and someone calls me on the phone and says like, "Did you hear it?" And I was like, "What?" <laughs> it was just basically he was taking his son to like look at colleges or his daughter. Uh, Tony Soprano, and it was like the background music in a bar. 
So it was like I remember that. You don't often know how you don't know how they're going to use it until you see the movie. You know, unbelievable. Well, the album is. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to I'm just trying to imagine the look on your face when Scorsese's like, "Yeah, shout out to the Dropkick Murphys." <laughs> yeah, I gotta find that somewhere on YouTube because it was pretty awesome. The album is uh, "This Machine Still Kills Fascists." Let me ask you one last thing because um, Dropkicks were integral in reversing the curse, and I'm sure you're tired of talking about it, but people outside of New England might not know about Tessie and how it became synonymous with the Red Sox finally beating the curse of the Bambino. So what happened? Like, how did, how did that song become attached? And, I mean, from, from your perspective, like, what was the timeline? What, sure. what happened? So the Red Sox called us in um, early summer 2004, and it was a lot like getting the call from Nora Guthrie. You know, you're like, what? Like, you know, because growing up in Boston, when you think about the Yawkey ownership, yeah. they were so old school and crappy. They would have never had a rock band involved, you know? <laughs> and so the new ownership, you know, called, and we said, you know, they wanted John Kiley to cut his hair because he looked too much like a long hair. Yeah, right, the right, exactly. <laughs> so I said, uh, we're in. And then they said, great, we'll send you the song. And I heard the song. I said, we're out because it was just this old, like, you know, Broadway turn of the century song. Uh, um, so we ended up just taking the melody kind of and recreating the song and updating the lyrics. And um, um, Jeff Horrigan, who wrote for the uh, Herald at the time, sports writer, kind of we got with him on a lot of the history because, you know, I, I, I knew obviously about the Babe Ruth stuff, but there was so much more to it, you know. the So the story for people listening is the Red Sox, when they won a bunch of World Series uh, in the early 1900s before they traded Babe Ruth, they had this ardent group of fans, and apparently that's where the term fanatic came from, from these guys. They were called the Royal Rooters. It was uh, mostly Irish immigrants, um JFK's grandfather, Honey Fitz, who was mayor of Boston. John L. Sullivan, the bare knuckle boxing champ. Um, this guy, Nuff said McGreevy. And they would basically roll up on the games and, and sing this song, Tessie, but change the lyrics to basically heckle the uh, opposing team. And, and that's a rogues gallery, too, yeah, man. There's yeah, a yeah, bunch yeah. of tough customers. Yeah, right you don't there. want John L. Sullivan uh, no. up in your face. So basically... Um, when they traded Babe Ruth, the Royal Rooters turned their back on the Red Sox, stopped singing that song. So someone was digging through the history with the Red Sox, and they said, um, we need to bring this song back. So we re 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 we recorded it that summer. We debuted it on the field July 23rd, 2004, pregame, um, played it live. And uh, on the day before, I'm sorry, it was the 24th, on the 23rd, I did an interview at the Herald and guaranteed a World Series. I didn't believe it. I was just talking trash. Yeah. And and then so we debut it, and they're getting killed, like 9-1. to one. And we're like, oh, crap. We didn't even get out of the starting gate. But that ended up being the game where uh, A-Rod a and Veritech got into a fight, right. and they had a huge comeback, and Bill Miller – hit a uh, walk off home run and the rest was history and you know but that year was so intense because we were so involved with the team like when when we were down three nothing down to our final strike dave roberts is you know what led to the steal i'm getting you know phone calls don't ever get involved with <laughs> my own my own friends you know you're a jinx don't ever get They're involved with another team yeah <laughs> So, like, that steal was literally life or death for me, you know? That was the first thing I thought. I was like, all right, dropkicks are involved. It's like, oh, God, man, what happens if the Red Sox become, you know, the Red Sox? Like, we, we're yeah, just yeah, so yeah. used to being crushed by these guys. Yeah. Uh, the best thing about that was getting to call all my, you know, New York friends and for all of us. The first time we played in New York after that happened, it was like the Blues Brothers. We went on stage. We <laughs> dropped the screen. <laughs> And played all the highlights, and they were just humming beer bottles at the screen. Yeah, so I said, I came back out. I said, "You don't wait eighty six years to rub it in, and then not rub it in." So, yeah. Listen, uh, it's a beautiful album. It really is, and I couldn't be happier for you. I'm proud of you guys. You guys, Thank you, man. You guys, you know, you're as real as it gets. Dropkick Murphys. This machine still kills fascists. Ken Casey, you know I love you, man. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for coming through. I bless you, man. Love you too.